Hi, I'm Stefan Forbes, uh, filmmaker of Hold Your Fire. Two guys asked me to pick up something from the bottom shelf. And when I stood up, the guy had a 25 automatic. Puts it to my head. Someone outside called the cops. Four terrorists had been surprised inside the store on Friday afternoon. No, they didn't know who we were. Holy crap, 12 hostages inside a sporting goods store loaded with firearms. We opened the door. There were cops everywhere. That's when things went haywire. The perps certainly had evil intent. Kill the hostages, go out in the blaze of glory. We didn't want to go out in the blaze of glory. The hell, if you gonna execute me, and I got all these guns in it, what do you think I'm gonna do? I'm gonna defend myself. All my life, police was killing black people. I know for a fact that cops aren't racist. We never discriminated against anybody. A story of violence inside a sporting goods store in Brooklyn. Botched robbery, killed a police officer. I don't think that they believed they could get out alive. Bullets was flying all over the store. They wanted blood. I was terrified. We're through. Cops usually wind up overreacting. Kill them all. No, I believe in talking. Harvey Schlossberg, he didn't look like a cop, he didn't act like a cop. But he had his PhD in psychology. I believe police could influence people without bullying. The most difficult thing in the world to change is a culture. Now we gotta talk to these individuals. It was revolutionary. This is the birthplace of hostage negotiation. You're looking to find that key that opens that guy's head. My mother? Do anything you can to make a conversation. You must get them to talk. I'm trying to figure out a way to end this thing. The crowd got tired of hand. You might have a massacre on your hands. Nobody really knows what the next move is going to be. Just give me a reason to kill you. Oh, my God. All their fire. All their fire. Everything is under control. I want him out alive. This is Factual America. We're brought to you by Alamo Pictures, an Austin and London-based production company making documentaries about America for international audiences. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Each week I watch a hit documentary and then talk with the filmmakers and their subjects. This week it is my pleasure to welcome award-winning filmmaker Stefan Forbes, cinematographer and director of Hold Your Fire. Stefan provides us with a riveting account of a hostage situation in Brooklyn in January 1973 when four young African-American men were caught stealing guns in a sporting goods store and took a dozen hostages. Hold Your Fire has all the ingredients of a Sidney Lumet film, as tense as any thriller from that period. The involving human stories and lasting impact of the events makes for an absorbing, gripping film with theatrical potential, says Alan Hunter, ScreenDaily.com. Fast-paced, suspenseful, real-life thriller featuring an array of fascinating characters, compelling, writes Frank Sheck of Hollywood Reporter. Gripping showcases the director's skill with locating sympathy in a morally dubious or compromised character, notes Brent Simon of GoldenGlobes.com. A searing look into a little-known moment in history with the profound re- repercussions for how we understand policing today. Grade A, says Tambay Obinson of IndieWire. Stay tuned as we discuss how Stefan brought this incredible story to the big screen. Stefan, welcome to Factual America. How are things with you? They're great. You know, I'm out here just in the midst of a huge crisis of violence and masculinity in America and trying to pound the table for this crazy thing we've discovered called conflict resolution. We've never really heard of it over here before. (laughs) Well, uh, it's, it's much needed as you've already pointed out, uh, to remind our, uh, our listeners and uh, viewers, we're talk. The film is "Hold Your Fire." Uh, has a theatrical release in the U.S. on May twentieth, and will also be found on iTunes. Uh, in terms of the U.K. and other uh, locales, uh, I would just suggest you uh, keep an eye out for it. Um, 
do a, do a search every now and then, and I'm sure it will be making its way to the theater near you soon. Um, Stefan, maybe you can get us started, because uh, probably most of our audience has not uh, seen or seen this film yet. Uh, uh, you've kind of more than alluded to it, but what is Hold Your Fire all about? It's about, you know, this incredible event back in 1973 in Brooklyn, where four young uh, African-American men were stealing guns for self-defense. The police assumed that they were members of the Black Liberation Army yeah. and came down with all the force of the NYPD. Soon they were surrounded by a thousand angry cops. Uh, they were sitting on an arsenal of weapons and it just it, it, it snowballed into an event full of miscommunications and misunderstandings, mistaken identity, and it soon became tragically violent. And it, 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 I was amazed to discover this because I love, you know, the old 1970s movies like mm. Serpico and Dog Day Afternoon exactly. and, and all these American uh, stories of violence and New York and multicultural stuff. But I wanted to tell it in a 21st century way, kind of bringing out voices we might not have heard back then, hearing all different kinds of perspectives on what really happened involving race mm -hmm. and uh, class and the police brutality that we didn't really understand back then what was going mm -hmm. on, but provides us an incredible window onto what this event became, which was the birth of modern hostage negotiation. Yeah, I, I definitely would like to dive into that uh, more, but I mean, how did you, how did this film come about? How did you come across this incredible story and why, you know, it's, it's as you say, 1973, so we're looking at almost 50 years later before this actually makes it to the big screen. Well, as a filmmaker, you know, I made a film called Boogeyman about a, yeah. a devious political operative named Lee Atwater. I've always been interested in culture clash, yeah. in, you know, opposing forces in society. And I think a lot of that comes from my mom, who was a very young girl, was kidnapped from her home in Poland by Stalin. Oh, my goodness. Her whole community was put on a train and taken to a work camp near Siberia. People froze to death on the train and were thrown out at every stop like kindling. You know, this er childhood trauma that she suffered, you know, it comes down through the generations. Uh, there's, we now know that trauma is passed on epigenetically to family members. And I'd always wrestled with what she went through, and I could see that it was it was buried trauma in her life, never had any tools to really resolve it. And I wondered, who are the people that understand conflict in our society? You know, how do they intervene? How do they diffuse and de-escalate and save lives and, and intervene in this process of war and suffering and violence that often seems so, you know, like there's no way to, to interact or to to solve it. And I've been looking for a story like this for 10 years as a doc filmmaker. Mm -hmm. I traveled to Kenya. I shot in the Rift Valley with warring tribes carrying Kalashnikovs over their shoulders as they herd cattle. Mm -hmm. You know, I talked to people who mediate between Sunni and Shiite in Iraq. And then I found this crazy story in my hometown of New York, uh, my adopted hometown. I'm really from Boston. But I learned that in this top-down authoritarian militaristic institution called the NYPD, which at 40,000 people is larger than many countries' armies, yeah. that there was a guy, a peacenik, a radical pacifist police officer with a PhD in psychology spreading this message of radical empathy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? You know, I got totally fascinated with Harvey Schlossberg and how he came to be. And that was kind of my way into the story. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's, it's an incredible, well, there's many incredible uh, themes and, and uh, storylines in this, in this film. Uh, but this, uh, this Harvey Schlossberg, I mean, I think as he's described early on uh, for, at first, he's, he's a traffic cop, right? He's, he's actually not even, he's just a traffic cop who happens to have a PhD. Um, maybe you can tell us a little more about that and what he how groundbreaking or seminal this event 
uh, was and, and still is. There had been three previous events. There was Attica, yeah. this uprising that ended in violent, violent domination. And they just mm. came in. They were firing bullets, spraying them around. They murdered their own prison guards. You know, it was this top down, we're going to dominate you solution that was just utterly wrong, didn't work. Then along came Dog Day Afternoon, which was a chaotic mess, as we all know from that film. Um, there was also Munich, where yeah. the authorities at that hostage situation completely screwed up. Again, all these lives were lost, and Harvey had been watching this stuff. They asked him to come up with a solution, which is this... You know, this outcast, this Jewish intellectual and a cop of violent, macho Irish guys. And he's, he came up with a solution that they thought was fruity, which is code word yeah. back then for being a homosexual. He said, yeah. you want us to talk to these criminals instead of killing them? You know, that's insane. But here we are on this street corner in Brooklyn where there's 12 hostages, women and children. And if they even throw tear gas in there, these explosives and this stockpile of ammunition is going to go sky mm -hmm. high and destroy a whole block of people. Uh, Harvey was pleading with them, please don't go in. They bring a tank. They're ready to smash through the wall and, and crush mm -hmm. people. Uh it's amazing that this man was able to affect change in this organization that totally didn't want to hear it. Mm. And, and luckily, there was a police chief that was seen, as they say in the film, as a panty waist. Yeah. His masculinity yeah. was also challenged. But he said, for, as a top-down decision, you're going to listen to Harvey, and we're going to yeah. try it his way. Yeah, he's also described as bookish, I think. It's, uh, I think, yeah, um, bookworm, you know, oh my God, no, 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 heaven forbid. I mean, this is, uh, there's so much in there. I, I love how it interplays with, um, uh, you know, it goes both ways, but either Harvey, you have Harvey on camera saying this is how you should do things, and then obviously they don't do that in the actual event, or, um, you know, they talk about bringing um, one of the, um, uh, perpetrator's mother in to talk to him and and as harvey says uh well usually people who are taking hostages and find themselves in these sort of situations don't usually have the best relationships with their families so you know it's not usually the you know so he's got all these great little nuggets of uh of knowledge a dynamic inactivity uh get to know the hostage takers anyone can speak but the real skill is listening you know uh it all seems like common sense but it was at least at the time, anything but for, for most people, or p you certainly know, the police. Uh, yeah, I'm really hoping that this film can have an impact in our society here in America, as you know, just riddled with guns. And we're really taught a domination model of, of interaction that we even see in school. You know, the best schools in America teach you enter conversations to win, you want to shut everyone else up and, and, and prevail. And there's a, a very different model that sounds intuitive, but it's incredibly hard to implement in our lives, mm -hmm. in our families, with our children. And we yeah. as men, learning to model for our sons, you know, we, I don't need to dominate you. I want to, I want to make sure that you hear, you know, you know, I hear you, you know, that your point of view is welcome and, and, let, I'm going to ask you some questions. We can resolve this without me trying to force a solution on you that causes you to resent me and builds up your your resistance. And that's a model that America doesn't understand. You see us, we did it in Iraq and Afghanistan. We come in with force and with weaponry and we build our own resistance and we make it incredibly hard to find solutions. Mm -hmm. That's the model that police are working on. And as I worked on this film, you know, during the deaths of Elijah McClain and Breonna Taylor, and we saw Michael Brown and Ferguson and George Floyd, it just became shocking to me that this model, mm -hmm. this brilliant model has existed in the police department for 50 years and we're still not teaching it to our officers. And why do you think that is? Again, it's this code that is written into America's DNA that we 
inherited from England and its domination of the colonies. You know, it is that a real man has to win. We got to be number one, that it's uh, we can't ever show weakness. We can't ever have a, a discussion. Um, these are things that are, are just baked into our economic system. They go so deep. And in learning to use conflict resolution tools, we challenge the very basis of our society, which is what's so fascinating and radical about the thought that Harvey Schlossberg brings out in this film. And I guess there's, I mean, as, as, as you've already mentioned, you know, you, you, your great film, Boogeyman, the Lee Atwater story, I mean, and that was about partly the form, fermenting of polarization and polarization's only gotten worse certainly, since that film came out, believe it or not. Um, uh, I mean, I guess there are lessons there as well, not just in terms of hostage uh, uh, situations, isn't there? Yeah, and, you know, in America especially, we love to pontificate about pluralism and the melting pot, and we're all one. But the dialogues that we have as a society are actually very top-down. And people from different groups are siloed, and we can't understand each other. And with the intensification of the internet and the AI that, mm -hmm. that seeks conflict mm -hmm. and really emotionally charged speech in order to engage people online, you know, it's become harder and harder. And that, that process of emotional wedge politics that Atwater specialized in has just spread across all platforms in our society. So this, this model of, of active listening, of letting people know you hear them and you understand their concerns, it's something that, you know, a lot of progressives think, oh, yeah, of course we do that. No, you don't. Mm. And these people on January 6th who are storming our capital don't feel heard or listened to in any way by the elites in America. And it, if we want to have a democracy, we're going to need to learn how to actually listen to people and make them feel heard because that's what a democracy is. So these are, this is an urgent message, you know, that I feel, especially in light of our politics, you know, we have kids committing suicide because they have no, they don't feel listened to or understood. And, you know, these techniques are, are crucial for, for anyone in any walk of life. It's this is not just a thriller about yes. cops and guns and tanks. You know, I want people to look a little deeper. Um, I think that's an excellent point. And why don't we, let's just hold it right there. We're going to give, uh, speaking of messages, we're going to let our sponsors have a quick message, but then we'll be right back uh, with uh, Stefan Forbes, director, cinematographer, writer. I mean, you did just about everything on this film, I think, uh, of uh, Hold Your Fire. Theatrical release on May 20th in the U.S. and will be also be able to be found on iTunes. If you enjoy Factual America, check out the Movie Maker podcast. That's all one word, Movie Maker. Where our friends at MovieMaker.com interview everyone from filmmakers just breaking in to A-listers like David Fincher and Edgar Wright about their movie-making secrets and behind-the-scenes tricks of the trade. They go deep and let the guests speak uninterrupted to get you the most film insight. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with uh, Stefan Forbes, director of Hold Your Fire. We've been talking about the the uh, about his film and the many lessons that can be learned from this. Not just about a it's it's not just a send up of 19 early 70s uh, cop films and and the like. It's 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 so much more than that. And the one thing that struck me as well is um, we do relive relive this story in practically in real time, the way you've, um, but these remarkable interviews with those who were there. Um, and, you know, it's also a film, it struck me, uh, but uh, that it's a film about memory or different memories. And as you've already said, that things are seldom what they seem. There's so many assumptions are made by the different parties, especially the police, but, uh, and we also come to these situations with all kinds of backgrounds and baggage, if you will. Um, and, um, you know, uh, how, I mean, that was, that's incredible. This many years later to find all these people who were still around who could talk. And the, and the thing that struck me is 
how real these this this these memories still are. Uh, you know, it's not like the they've really faded with time. Yeah, trauma is really interesting. Um, I was just talking to Steve Gilroy, the officer who was shot, to his niece yeah. yesterday. Yeah. yeah. And she told me she can remember at five years old saying goodbye to him when he went off on his shift for the NYPD and the feel of the cold floor on yeah. her bare feet as she said, be careful out there, Uncle Steve. Yeah. Like it's seared into her mind. And we were talking about how trauma is passed on epigenetically hmm. and, you know, especially in the Jewish uh, culture, as Harvey was like this lone Jew on a force of Irish guys, you know, there are centuries of, of suffering and oppression that you mm. carry with you. You carry the markers in your genes and there's a culture of, of, you know, Tikkun Olam and healing the world that I think is really present in this. Mm. But a lot of the people that I interviewed, their trauma is bursting out all mm. over and you can see it on their faces. And for me as a filmmaker, you know, I'm always delving into people's memories, but interviews become really intense, almost mm. sacred spaces where someone is confiding in you. And for Shuey Brahim, in prison for 37 years, mm. you know, we, we built a lot of trust in, until it wasn't a point when, you know, I'm asking him, can I tell your story? He's like, hey, when the hell are you going to start filming me? I've been carrying these stories for decades. And no one's ever asked me really mm. how we saw things, what really happened. And this guy called a cop killer, wanting to be thrown away by society as a man who should never be released. It turns out he probably didn't kill, and neither of his friends no. uh, killed this cop. It looks like it was probably friendly fire. And cops have said to me off camera, they didn't find the bullet. You know, we always find the bullet. Uh, he was shot in the side of the head, this cop, as he peered out at the store from mm -hmm. behind a pillar. That bullet probably came from behind mm -hmm. or to the side. And this, this perspective of shoe waves that's never been heard is really incredibly difficult trying to weave that in with the voices of these cops mm -hmm. and with these these hostages. Again, I was saying before, we pay lip service to pluralism, but it's incredibly hard to tell a story from multiple perspectives. That's one mm. reason this took so long for me to edit. You're trying to weave a way in and actually tell a narrative that sounds completely insane and confusing when you try to let different voices yeah. in the room. Yeah. So, you know, our national project of America, where we, we, we integrate everyone's voices, I actually have a lot more sympathy for our country because, and for what Europe is going through now with immigration. It's yeah. not easy to welcome everyone's voice into the mm. room. Mm. No, I think it's a that's a that's a very good point, and I think it's um, you know having um, well having watched it and even listened to vast parts of it again. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's just. Uh, it it just is amazing how how the same events everyone can see things differently, um, and the misunderstandings, um, you know, even about that incident with uh, with the, the 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 shot police officer. You know, uh, someone said, "Well, he said uh, something about you pig," and he didn't. He did say that, but not about that. <laughs> you know, it wasn't about. And also, I think it was very interesting. You know, they were self defense, but self defense from whom? And because they were black and going in, it was just assumed they were, like you said, black liberation army, and they'd already broken with the nation of Islam. And so, uh, and you know, the time these guys, I mean, only recently have most some of them have even gotten out of jail. Isn't that right? Yeah, and. We uncovered such a different story than you've heard in the media, which is often dominated by the policemen's union. And they have these victims putting out these incredible victim statements that make it sound like they hate this guy and they want him locked up forever and he's dangerous. One thing I discovered because Shuaid, after getting released, has become such a respected voice in the restorative justice movement. He's gone through a process of really deep self-examination over his role in even trying to steal those mm. guns and people dying as a result. He's an incredibly 
wise and insightful person about masculinity and violence. He's a voice that shouldn't be locked up, mm. but someone who can be a healer in our communities and can teach everyone what we need to do as a society. And that's, that was a real surprise to me that oftentimes our justice system of lock them up and throw away the key is not victim centered. Mm. Victims don't want somebody just thrown away because they know they're going to come back into the, into the community. Their children won't have had a father. The, they won't have worked through the things they need to do. And victims have questions. They want a dialogue with the person who harmed them. They, they, don't, they don't believe in our justice system because they've seen it failing time and time again. So the solutions and many of the men who understand these patterns and how to intervene in them Mm. are not in their communities where they belong, actually using the skills that they might have learned in prison. So that's another huge message for our film that we need to explore restorative justice and listen to the victims who actually want to change the whole models that we're working with here. Mm. No, and I, and I think um, in trying to get that message out, because um, I'm also cognizant we don't have, uh, I'm, unfortunately we don't have that much time left uh to discuss this incredible film but uh uh in getting that message out you had quite a quite a team helping you with this um could you say something about how um you know how fab five freddy got involved and um sam pollard we've had sam pollard on this podcast on to discuss uh, mlk fbi which is another incredible film uh i I mean, I'm going to miss people. I know you're going to tell me I'm missing people. We've got people like Jonathan Sanford, which uh, is the composer, although probably people watching this film may not, th you know, may think about it. But there's some incredible s sections of the film where I think the music is quite, quite poignant. Um, thank, thank you so much for noticing Jonathan's work. You know, we were in a band together in L.A. Okay. Uh, and I play music and, you know, the music is so crucial to me and his involvement, you know, I think he's going to be a really big composer. He's doing all kinds of TV shows and features now. Uh, but we rewrote this music probably 10 times. And, mm. you know, he, he helped bridge the gap from like seventies funk to neoclassical. I mean, mm. he's an incredible composer. We also worked with my friend, John Beasley, who's mm. an incredible keyboardist who we collaborated on a show called Monk Uncut at Disney Hall in Los Angeles. He has a big band called Monkestra. He's a, a Grammy winning composer who toured as a kid with Miles Davis. Wow. Just an incredible voice yeah. in himself. And, and with John, we, he brought in his trio with Terry on Gully and Edwin Livingston, and they improvised live in the studio to picture. And we shaped those improvs and then incorporated them back into the film. So there's portraits of different people like Ben Ward, an African-American mm. chief of police in New York City, who's, again, trying to influence this often very high bound and rigid officer corps who resent him as a black man being above them telling them what to do john would do improvs on the piano and we talk about the scene and the character and he'd go back and, and do a completely different one so it was amazing working with him and with my friend fab five freddy who i've known forever when i started making the film i was like fab you're from that part of brooklyn yeah. tell me what's up you know and he brought me down to the hood and introduced me to his uncle Fab is from a tradition of like Brooklyn Marxist intellectuals. His dad was super close with Max Roach, who is right. Fab's godfather. So, right. you know, he said, yeah, that store, that's where we used to buy our sneakers. That was the strip we used to go shopping. Yeah. And so I had this grounding in, in the neighborhood that when cops would say, yeah, you know, that wasn't Broadway with the bright lights and the stars. That was... Broadway in Brooklyn with the dead rats and the junkies and the dirty needles. Yeah. You, you take your life in your hands. And I was like, oh my God, that's so cinematic. That's yeah. how I should start the movie. And then I'm like, yeah. wait, wait, no. Fab told me it was actually a, a decent neighborhood where he, families would go shopping. Yeah. I can't fall into this, this, you know, 70s crime film narrative. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, in, in, 
having a wider array of friends and trusted sources like a Sam Pollard who's going to watch it. But you don't fall into these cliches, no matter mm. how dramatic they may seem. And, and you have a multiplicity of perspectives when you approach a historical story, which, frankly, it's boring if you're going to tell it the old white people's frame. Mm. You know, open that up a little. It's hard to constantly weave in these conflicting voices, but that's my belief of what a film and an American society should be a rich conversation, you know? Yeah. And I think you've, you, well, my opinion, I think you've done extremely well. And it's, uh, as you say, every, I, I feel like every voice is represented here. Um, the hostages' voices are heard, at least in, in certainly, if in some cases, through the, the family members and, and the legacy that this has had. Um, and it's interesting when it's all, it's almost like they are having a conversation, even though none of them are in the same room, right? You know, it's a, it's a, how you would hope we would all be, uh, engaging, uh, with each other. So, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Steph you know, my, my conception of a good documentary film is like, it's just like a, a dinner party. You can invite all these people that never speak in our society and let them throw things back and forth and engage in this dialogue that is so much richer when you're not just hearing people lob mm. verbal, you know, fusillades at each mm. other in the media. Let's really have a more intimate discussion. And let's, you know, the cops themselves, I thought they were very, very uh, well-rounded and nuanced in their sort of in their own views of how that and how they approached it, the different ones. But that was again part of this conversation, and I think that was uh, all all extremely well done. And it's a um, um, it's it's a great piece uh, film. I'm sure you'll uh, I'm sure it will do well. And uh, just want to thank you again, uh, Stefan, for uh, for coming on to the podcast. It's it's great to finally get you on. And uh, just remind our listeners, we're uh, we've been talking with Stefan Forbes, director of Hold Your Fire, uh, theatrical release on May twentieth. It's also coming out on iTunes. And for those outside the uh, U.S. or North America, do uh, do keep a lookout for this because it's well worth uh, worth a watch. I'd like to give a shout out to Sam and Joe Graves at Intersound Audio in Eskrick, England in deepest, darkest Yorkshire. A big thanks to Nevin Apanovich, podcast manager at Alamo Pictures, who ensures we continue getting great guests onto the show. And finally, a big thanks to our listeners. As always, we love to hear from you, so please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas. You can reach out to us on YouTube, social media, or directly by going to our website, www.factualamerica.com and clicking on the Get In Touch link. And as always, please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Almo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.